recorded in the beautiful mountains of British Columbia. Welcome to Friends, Friends on Horses. Horses. All right. Uh, welcome back to the Friends on Horses podcast. Today we have special guest Dr. Michaela Hempen, who we are in interviewing all the way from Palma. Our guest is a veterinarian and equine scientist who is currently working on an important research project. The goal of this project is to find a behavioral approach to reducing cribbing in horses. Michaela has a very interesting approach to her research that we hope to get into today. We will also hear all about the star of her research project, Blondie. You can learn more about her research, see videos, and donate on her website, blondie.pages.ontraport.net. Welcome, Michaela. Hey, thank you for having me. <laughs> we are so excited to have you. Um, I, I was wondering if you could maybe take us through how you decided to research cribbing specifically of all the different um, horse behaviors that there are out there. Yeah, um, it's very personal that um, I never had a cribbing horse until I probably maybe get blondie. <laughs> But uh, we had a horse in, the, uh, in our herd that was an eventer. It was um, a German warm blood that used to do um, yeah, com competing. And he had a stressful life, you know, all the things you know about uh, competition horses, staying in, in the box and, and uh, getting a lot of concentrates and so on. So ticked all the boxes and he was cribbing a lot. Then the owner retired him and he came to us and in our herd, the horse, there's a group of horses, there were at the time at least 12 horses, I think. They had ad libitum hay. He was ridden only occasionally on a very easy trail rides, you know, mostly walk um, with um, two yeah, women that were mostly wanting to chat. So it uh, was really quite relaxed and he, did continue crib biting same way. There was no change whatsoever. And everything we know or that we think we know about cribbing is always you have to take the horses out in the field, give them friends, give them plenty of roughage, and it will go away. This is what the vets tell you because really they don't, there, there's not, nothing else to give to the owners as, a, as, as an advice. And he continued and it was so bad, he, he even cribbed on the back of my young mare that I just got, a two-year-old. He also did it on others, but I cared more about my youngster. <laughs> and I, uh, yeah, it was, it was very hard to see that. And if you think you do everything right, the husbandry is right, the feeding is right, he has social companions, uh, he's not stressed out, and uh, it's not changing. So I was just intrigued by, by that. And... I was really curious to find out if there's anything we could do better for, for mm -hmm. that horse. Yeah. Interesting. So, um, so the most common approach to resolve cribbing is an enrichment approach, sounds like. And for this horse, um, enrichment um, wasn't effective. No, and I've, there are many reports of people that have been trying this um, and it did, not, it did not work. We know that it it may occasionally work. People say that they have taken horses out and they stopped cribbing. However, there's no scientific uh, evidence for that. So it's just people saying, but you know, I don't know if they've done 24 hour videos to see if the horse really did not crib or it's just not cribbing when they are there. Right. Um, and we also don't have before and afters. So it's, that is just anecdotal. So people are saying that I'm not really convinced that is, that is true. Mm -hmm. In any event, I want every horse to be out in a herd, in a group, and having at lipitum hay, whether they're cribbing or not. That is, that is a given. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the owners are left with an advice that is not helpful. And then they start doing other things that are worse to stop the cribbing. Oh, interesting. Um, and uh, probably should, for our audience, um, define uh, what cribbing is, <laughs> if, if you don't mm -hmm. mind. Um, uh, t speaking to what cribbing is and uh, maybe some of the tools that people are currently using to try and stop cribbing. Right, so cribbing is a, is a behavior that um, mostly stabled horses are doing, so you wouldn't find it in, in feral horses. 
but um, it's basically a very well-defined behavior and where the horse would grab with his upper incised teeth on a horizontal surface and pull back and it seems like they are sucking in air and they make a grunt noise and they do it repetitively so they may be doing it you know five times or ten times in a row um, and until maybe they stop doing something else and they go back to to uh, to that behavior and it's very distressing for the people watching it much more than for the animal itself so um, it's it's really it's very much stigmatized you can say so owners with horses that crib they have <laughs> they also have a tough life and that reflects back on the horses mm. because these horses are often sold for that reason um, so you know they have more owners mm. they've been handed they are handed around uh, they may not find the best stables um, because people don't want a cribber in their herd or in their in their stall um, and of course, there are some health um, disadvantage, health effects as well. So the most, the one you can really see in older horses that have been cribbing all their life is that the teeth are worn down, and usually they are also skinnier. There, it's harder for them to put on weight um, because they are so busy with cribbing that they are not eating as much. Mm. And other things are often associated with cribbing, but really there's not such a good evidence for that. So whether it's associated with, with colic, for example, it's not, there's no evidence for a causal relationship. I would say it's probably happening at the same time. So you can't say one caused the other, but uh, horses that are developing cribbing because of certain conditions probably also develop a colic because of the same conditions and the same with ulcers. Right. So even though this has been linked a lot, um, also by public opinion or horse people opinion, in terms of scientific evidence, there's not so much. So I see it more of a welfare concern in the sense that um, certainly there is a reason why horses begin to grip. So they have, there have been some, there's been some events in their life that caused them to crib. And that can be various reasons. And it's very difficult to say that there's one reason why horses begin to crib. It's probably different for each individual horse. Mm -hmm. And also it doesn't help you much to find a solution. Um, so if you try to find, certainly there are certain things you want to learn how to prevent it, but a horse already cribs. The question is what do you, can you offer to help that horse or the owner to address that problem? So you asked um, Emma what, what people do to stop cribbing. Well, one is, is trying to um, change the environment in a way that they can't put so that because they need to initially have to put their incisor teeth on a horizontal surface so you could either try to remove all the surfaces mm -hmm. or what people also do is they put uh, electric tape on the surface so they can't put their teeth on it right which of course is quite stressful because they are they will be scared to touch anything because there's always the electric uh, fence the electric uh, tape and um, or people also try with some deterrent taste. So I don't know, they, there are different things you could try to put. So when they put their mouth on it, it tastes terrible. Yep, I but this of, um, friends painting their fences with um, hot sauce. <laughs> yeah, as so a deterrent. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And did it help? No, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, yes. yes. And, and in fact, and, um, um, so I think, I, I wonder if uh, one reason why people think that that does help is for horses, um, or in my case, I've got a couple of donkeys who aren't cribbers, but they chew on wood. Mm -hmm. So then you put something on the wood and then they don't chew on it, but they're not, they're not cribbers. So maybe people, maybe it's a myth that we're creating because it works for some horses, but those horses um don't have that stereotypy behavior mm. yeah yeah i think people are really just grasping anything that could maybe work so blondie's owner tried that as well it did not it did not work um mm. then the other thing how to mechanically stop them from cribbing would uh, be for example a surgery um that is also done sometimes where um 
the veterinarian would remove part of the muscle that allows them to do this movement or um, they may also take a, yeah, some of the nerves out. Uh, there's a certain specific surgery that is, that is done, but I've seen a horse that has um, yeah, undergone that surgery and he's old now and he keeps cribbing and all his teeth are worn down up to the gum. It had no effect whatsoever. Uh, that's I a think shame. with that, with the surgery, with the surgery, it can work. There's a very wide range of uh, efficacy. So you sometimes have some that works, but they did definitely stop and others it has no effect whatsoever. So there's a wide range. Mm -hmm. It can work, it, ca it cannot do anything. So it's, it's not a very good approach considering it's very invasive. And also right. it reduces the value of the horse a lot because they have then a real hole in their neck. Um, mm. So they are again at risk in terms of welfare because they are handed down to other people and more people and more people, mm -hmm. which I always think is also, we also need to consider that, that the horses don't stay in their, in their family. Mm -hmm. The more owners usually the worse. Yeah. Right. Then wondering, apart from, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I'm wondering, um, it kind of leads into another question that Emma and I had just around the myths around cribbing. Um, you know, we often hear about cribbing talked about as a learned behavior. Um, would you say in your experience that this is factual or more of a myth? I'm surprised you say that this is the, what people are talking about. Maybe in Canada it's different. <laughs> because, <laughs> uh, because I think most people don't really say it's, or in my context, they wouldn't say it's a learned behavior. Mm -hmm. Where I would say absolutely, it is definitely learned behavior. Mm -hmm. But when I'm saying it, it's more, I feel like it's more revolutionary to say it's actually, a, it's an operant behavior, it's a learned behavior. Mm -hmm. I think the co in common understanding, well, common understanding, what is usually talked about sort of is that it's, it's much more, um, maybe a Automatic would be a way to describe it. It's mm -hmm. that the, the reason for it is an organic, it's an organic reason. Mm -hmm. So the animal is, uh, has uh, acidosis, has ulcers, there's brain physiology that has changed that sort of internal reasons that would make the horse crib. Well, so veterinarians obviously we look at organs, we look at some pathology inside the animal. That's what we're trained to find. Um, so we try to pinpoint a reason there, but actually I would totally agree with saying that this is a learned behavior mm -hmm. and we have to actually look at it as an, as an operant learned behavior. And very, in, very interesting. Very interesting. Now, some people might confuse that and, um, feel free to correct me if I'm incorrect, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, one cock, what I think is a common myth is that horses in a barn will learn to crib from other horses, um, which I believe has been disproven. Uh, so people might say, think that um, cribbing is a learned behavior, therefore they can learn it from each other, when what you're, I don't think that that's exactly what you're saying, is that right? All oh, right, okay, now I, now I see what, <laughs> where you're coming from. Uh, yes, I agree with you. So. Um, I do not think that they learn from each other. I wouldn't say it's disproven, but those studies that seem to show this effect are based on questionnaires. Um, they did not actually, you know, do an experiment saying that, let's see if any horse learns how to do it, because I don't think there would be any owner who would accept to the, that type of experiment. But um, so there's very, very weak evidence for that. Um, so I don't think it is. It's learned. It's obviously learned. It's not something the horse is born with or it's something the horse has learned. Uh, maybe, I think the, the theory that I, or the hypothesis that I like the most uh, yeah. is that it's strongly linked to, to the weaning. So when they're separated from their mothers at a very young age, six months, uh, they are often very often taken away from the mothers and put in a box in a stall. Right. 
and they change the feed very often to make them grow very quickly so because they want to sell them maybe at the age of two uh, or younger even um, so they want them to grow quickly and have you know a shiny coat and lots of uh, body to show so yeah. they start feeding them concentrates um, they are separated from their mothers they still want to suckle and they are alone in a store they mm -hmm. don't have enough hay so what do they do they, they go and look for comfort they look mm -hmm. for their for the other they look for them for the mom yeah and they don't find it so as they are searching with their with their nose they might come to a surface that they can hold on to and they keep start sucking and they may get some comfort in that because they are totally distressed being alone um, and maybe that gives them a little bit of comfort so this this is where the learning could start okay but some other horses could also learn it later in life or um, even earlier in life um, it seems they are they even falls are still with their mothers um, i've heard that they might be starting it already but this theory, this hypothesis to me sounds very, very convincing. Okay, interesting. So it sounds like it starts off potentially as a welfare issue. So there's some type of stress that, um, that is likely to contribute to cribbing, to the, to the beginnings of cribbing. Um, Could be. And I, and I read once, and again, um, let me know, you know, what your thoughts on this um, are that um, there's p possibly a genetic component or a genetic link to um, in horses that crib you know like uh, thoroughbreds mm. might be more likely to be cribbers than other horses potentially that there's a genetic predisposition to that well there are a couple of papers on that also with trotters um, yeah um, northern european trotters i think uh, norwegian or finnish but if you think of it how these horses are kept you know, I think it's a confounding factor because the way that uh, thoroughbreds and anyway, racehorses are kept, they are also taken away very early from their moms. They're separated, they're fed concentrates, they're highly stressed. Um, so I don't, and it's not very convincing to me uh, mm -hmm. that it's. I, I that makes so. sense. <laughs> I see where you're coming from. There, there are too many other factors it right that, that exactly it, within that yeah um which is probably and we'll get into that later but one benefit of single subject research design versus other types of <laughs> research right yeah <laughs> right <laughs> uh, i'm curious we often hear people talking to you about um you know horses who have started cribbing um almost they that they'll continue cribbing because as they're inhaling the oxygen it almost creates a euphoric experience for them can you speak to that at all <sighs> who knows <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, i don't they 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 let's say let's look at it this, this way they, the horses are doing it because it gives them something mm -hmm. right if not they wouldn't continue doing it mm -hmm. so it gives them whatever we want to put a name on it you know it can be you know some people talk about dopamine uh, serotonin or the uh, oxygen flash or uh, we don't know mm -hmm. we don't know but in either way it's 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 something the horse seeks to get so they, they want to it's meeting a need yeah fulfills a function it, yes which mm -hmm. is interesting because in the uh, this is why i don't like to use the the label of um, stereotypy in this context because in the veterinary field in the stereotypy is often said to be a behavior that is has no function mm. oh all. interesting huh because it's not obvious right so it has no obvious function but obviously there is some function there yeah. why would the horse do it mm -hmm. um so it doesn't matter what the horse get out of it there's something it gets out of it mm -hmm. so that's why it continues doing it interesting so i don't see a lot of benefit in trying to identify what the horse gets out of it and that may also be different for each individual horse who knows right maybe they they may actually if you look at um the applied behavior analysis field so you would look at say people 
who show stereotypic behavior. Let's, let's just call it a, a repetitive behavior. Mm -hmm. So you have very little variation in the behavior and it's repetitive. There, there are actually studies that say that they may be doing it because they want to avoid a task. So they are trying to get away from something rather than getting something out of the behavior. Right. So you could be saying the horse starts cribbing because that way the owner doesn't take him out for a ride. Ah, okay. So you need to test that because you don't know. So you mm -hmm. need, need to see what happens uh, if I crib and this consequence follows. Does the cribbing get more or less? And then you would have to see how that changes in order to identify is the horse doing it to avoid something or in order to get something. Right. And look at it objectively like, like a little mini research project rather than going yeah. in with preconceived ideas about what might be causing the cribbing. Exactly. Hmm. And then you, you are shifting also totally because instead of looking at what's wrong inside the animal, you are thinking which conditions in the environment cause the horse to react in that way. Right. And there you're getting to somewhere where you can actually change something because you cannot go inside, you know, your horse's brain and try to fix some neural connections. Yeah. But you can change something environment. Right. Right. And when I say that, um, I always immediately have to add so people don't, get uh, me on the wrong path when I say changing something in the environment I do not mean enrichment mm -hmm. every horse should have enrichment for me that's a given I give the horse something to eat and I give the horse enrichment so yes. when I I assume that this has to be taken care of anyway yeah but I need to change something in the environment to, to get uh, some influence on the behavior so I'm shifting the responsibility also to me it's not the horse's fault that he cribs Mm -hmm. It's not that there's something wrong with the horse that he cribs. There's something wrong in the environment that I have, well, maybe not wrong, but something in the environment triggers the cribbing and I have to find out what it is. Mm -hmm. If I find out what it is, I can maybe change it. But to do this, you have to be systematic. You have to be scientific about it. Right. And that's, that's why probably nobody has uh, ever seen it because you have to, you have to change things systematically and uh, and then measure and stay with it for a long time in order to find out what's the reason that the horse cribs or what's what sets him off to crib. Right so identifying the function of the behavior and treating it similarly to um, a behavior modification program kind of right putting together a systematic approach um, to figuring out what the function is and then addressing that function? Yeah. Um, actually, uh, I'm not trying to change the behavior. I'm not trying to change the cribbing. Yeah. So I'm focusing, what I'm focusing on is the non-cribbing. I like so that. So on the which, on which conditions is the horse not cribbing? Right. Right. So I'm trying to create conditions where the horse is not cribbing. And that can be very, few occasions. So Blondie is cribbing an average of once per minute. Hmm. Wow. So how on earth are you going to find <laughs> a moment where she does not crib? But you have to find that. And um, you start with this little tiny moment where she's not cribbing and try to understand why she's not cribbing then. Mm -hmm. And that's your starting point. Cool. And then you check, okay, if I change something, she starts cribbing. What did I change? You know, what was it that's made her start cribbing? And you need to find a pattern um, to see what could be the trigger for that horse to start cribbing. And in the beginning, it could be anything. You don't know. You have to assume it can be anything. It can be, it could also be something we cannot perceive. You know, it could be a smell. It could be, so you need to be systematically checking out. And I think the more we do it in the, hopefully in the future, the more we get to a list of the most frequent triggers. It's ah. probably going to do, to do with feeding because very often it's linked to feeding, but we shouldn't assume that. We have to, we have to really 
check. I mean, I've started with two horses um, doing um, 24 hour video recording of their behavior. And then I tried to see if there's a pattern. And I had only two horses, but both of these horses had completely different patterns. Huh. Interesting. So one was, was cribbing more when she got hay, and the other one was cribbing more when he did not have hay. Ah, interesting. Right? So what does that show us? That you, we have to look at the individual animal. We don't have to just say cribbing is because horses have ulcers. Mm -hmm. It's not that. We have to look at the individual horse and see for this horse what could be the trigger. And also we are not interested in this, if you want to find a solution, at this point, we are not interested in trying to see what causes it in the first place. That's another topic. That's how to prevent it. That's a different study. It's also important. But now I'm trying to see what can I do with a horse that already learned to crib and does it at such a high frequency. Okay. I like, I like that. When, when, <laughs> is the horse, when is the horse not cribbing? Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's, you need to find, you need to find a, clean, a clean loop, a clean starting point and then see how you can expand that. Um, and that actually is a good segue. I was thinking that um, uh, we could talk a little bit about Blondie and you, if you're okay with giving us some of Blondie's story um, and um, how, what uh, her role is in, in your research project. Yeah, absolutely. So Blondie is a now a six-year-old quarter horse mare uh, and she was in the the same stable where I temporarily kept my horses. And when she came, she was three years old, just started on the saddle, beautiful color. She has a Palomino color. And um, yeah, so sort of the only thing that was not good about her was the cribbing. And um, at that time I was also looking for my uh, master thesis. Well, I knew the topic already because uh, I wanted to do the cribbing and so I had my <laughs> subject basically because it was, I had easy access to her. She was in the same barn. So I asked the owner if he would agree with it and um, he generally liked what I was doing with my horses and uh, obviously would love anything that could help the cribbing. So he agreed that I uh, would do the research with her. And also the setting was, uh, even though not good for Blondie, uh, it was ideal for the research. So because she had only basically one surface where she would crib and I could put up a camera and would always have the cribbing behavior on, on camera. So that was in a way ideal for, for Blondie, not a very good condition. And she's still in the same place because she's in a, well, she's in a box with paddock. Uh, she has horses next to her, but uh, it's not what I would choose for my horses. Mm -hmm. So um, she she is ridden. Um, she's not doing competitions. Um, at least the owner is uh, is a caring person, but he's not sentimental about his horses. So right. he, um, uh, yeah, you know, he's not he's not uh, he's not a terrible person. He does care for them, but. Yeah, I would care more. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so he does, um, he's right, uh, and uh, there's nothing, no competition at least, so it's, yeah, that's, that's fine. And I've been seeing her um, after I left that stable, um, because I was there only for a short time. I'm going to see her every weekend. So I go there Saturday and Sunday and I work with her for mm, less than an hour, maybe half an hour. Mm -hmm. And, and that's it. And I've also kept a little bit of distance because um, I'm not, say when you're doing an experiment, I program in that my presence is not part of the condi overall conditions. So I don't want me to be a cue for anything. Mm -hmm. So I'm setting things up and I disappear. And then I come back and I disappear. So I'm trying uh, to stay out of it. So it's not, I'm not cueing any of this. Okay, I'm sure, yeah, that's an important thing to, to make sure people know. Yes, yes. It's actually very, it, all of this is very carefully designed and I should maybe add at this point that I'm um, advised by Dr. Jesus 
Rosales Ruiz, who is a professor for behavior analysis at the I am University a, of North Texas. I'm a big fan of, and when I noticed that on your website, I got very excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm also a fan. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, because um, it's very, very cool. Um, Cool approach because he I think the combination is really good because I'm looking at from it from a veterinary uh, side of things and he has obviously the behavior analytic side of things and it combines really really nicely um, so um, the what, what he brings in tell me oh sorry to interrupt I was just gonna say for for our listeners who um, aren't behavior nerds like we are <laughs> Um, are you, would you mind just quickly mentioning um, uh, kind of who he is in the behavioral world? In the behavioral world, you refer to the science world or to the training world? How about both? Because he's a lot <laughs> to all of it, isn't he? <laughs> yes. So he's, uh, as I said, a professor at the University of North Texas at the Department of Behavior Analysis, Applied Behavior Analysis. And his research, um, well, maybe to make it easy for people to understand, he works a lot with uh, children with autism and to help them and their parents and caretakers. And, uh, but he's been invited uh, by Karen Pryor to, to Clicker Expo. So meeting as a scientist meeting the animal trainer world and enriching it with uh, with the science of behavior analysis so that we understand what's going on excellent description good <laughs> <laughs> and he's been uh, yeah he's been an inspiration i think for for many many people and how we look at, at behavior how we look at training and and also to have a scientific curiosity about it and uh, not take everything for granted, but actually try to investigate and understand it a little bit better. Well, there is your plug, Jose Rosales Ruiz. <laughs> yeah. Little promotion for him. <laughs> not Definitely that he needs that. Him out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my um, understanding is that um, the research that you're doing now is single um, subject um, research design. And you kind yes. of started talking about this at the beginning of our conversation, but I'm wondering if you can elaborate on why you chose um, this method for your study. Well, um, I think for this purpose, it's an ideal design. Uh, if, if you're coming from a veterinary world or generally say life sciences, um, or the health sciences, you are, probably not used to that design. So you're used to group designs and basically you're thinking, you know, the more the better uh, in order to get uh, results with statistical significance. So this is what I was used to. And then if you read um, a paper coming from behavior analysis and they talk about four or five subjects, sometimes even less, you, the first thought is, well, how can that say anything? It's just, you know, five individuals. You need at least 50 to say anything. Um, but then if you look at it closely, it's, uh, it's a very, very smart design because uh, so in a group design, what you would do is you, you'd have an experimental group and you compare that with a control group. But in order to compare, you are averaging each group. So, for example, you'd have eight horses in one group and eight horses in another group. And you do your experiment. So your experiment could be anything. Say you give them a drug or you give them to a certain training protocol with them, whatever, whatever your intervention or husbandry system also. So you have your individual eight measures in one group and another eight measures in another group. Then what you do is you take the average of one group. So your experiment group, the average of the eight horses, right? So say you have uh, something, you measure something between one and 10 and your average of those, so the, the, you sum it up, you divide it by the number of animals, your average is five. And then you do the control group, you do the same thing and your average is one. And then you see if this discrepancy is statistically significant, so there are some tests you can do. 
So this would be sort of roughly the standard approach. I mean, of course, there are refinements, but roughly that's a standard approach. The problem with that is that you, you miss the information about the single one hmm. because you've taken the average. Now, of course, you need a control. You cannot just, um, so what people mix up is if a single subject design may have only one subject, one individual that you are following, but it's a very carefully designed program. It's different from a case report. A case report would be, me as a veterinarian, I find a horse that cribs, I do something, the horse stops cribbing, and now I write a report about it. That's a case report. But I didn't do an experiment. I've just report what I've saw, what I've seen. In a single subject design, you actually do an experiment, only that the experiment is with one individual, or you can also repeat that with another two or three. But let's say one individual. And that design, um, this experimental design, builds the controls within the same animal. So you have a baseline where you would start observing the animal. You don't even have to take it long, say, make it long, say 10 minutes. So you collect your data of those 10 minutes and you follow that by a control where, for example, you don't do the intervention. So the first one, you maybe, maybe you give the horse a certain, I don't know, uh, a certain protocol, doesn't matter, an intervention. You take your, your, your measures and then you take that intervention away and then you repeat it again with that intervention and then you take the intervention away and you measure, for example, the behavior of the horse and a, a specific criterion. Say cribbing. How often does the horse crib? If you open the door, how often does the horse crib when you close the door? How often does the horse crib when you open the door? How often does the horse crib when you close the door? So that's an experiment and there's a control because you're, you're shifting the criteria. It's still the same animal, hmm. but you have controls built into it. And if in your data you see that there is a sharp decrease or increase change in the frequency of cribbing that gives you an indication that the, inter the, the change in the environment you did had an impact. So even though you have a single animal, you have very good evidence that it was the intervention that had an influence on the behavior. Okay. And the other really cool thing about it is, um, one, you don't need so many animals, so you can do it with the one you have. You can do it in a very short time. So you can do, as I said, 10 minutes or sometimes even five minutes. If you see that the change is very obvious, you can make it very short. So you can repeat it many times, which gives you more evidence, stronger evidence. Mm -hmm. um, and the other very cool thing that I like about it, which is important if you're trying to find a solution, is that you can change your experiment with depending on what answers the animal gives you. So you, be, you, you begin with a certain setup and you see the animal gives you some indication of what could work or what does not work and you adapt your protocol. So you try it over two days if you see hmm, that didn't work, let's try something else. And you try something else and say, oh, that's good, let's do that again. And you repeat that several times. So you're always adjusting it. When you're doing a group design, you are stuck. Mm. You have to experiment, you have your protocol, you have to do it from start to finish. You cannot deviate because you ruin your whole experiment. So you have to do it from start to finish. Mm. With single subject design, which is designed to find a solution, you can adjust it. Cool. Depending on the answers the animal gives you, basically. That's the mm. other really cool thing about it. Very yeah, interesting. That's why Very I chose interesting. it. Well, good choice. I'm a fan now. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, um, can speaking to uh, well, we're talking research now. So, uh, if you're able to share um, your uh, kind of approach to working with Blondie and cribbing, and and some of where you're at now with um, with uh, what well, you're moving towards an eventual outcome, but um, uh, kind of where you're at right now and what you're doing with Blondie. Okay, yeah, I'd love to. So Blondie, um, obviously, you know, it takes a while to, since, since there's no, nobody we can copy from, so we are really 
totally blind in this process. Right, because uh, no one we else has out, done this yet, right? No, no, where no one else has gone before. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we started with the, the, I mentioned it earlier, with the 24 hours observation, right? So from that, uh, I started seeing a pattern where Blondie would increase the frequency of cribbing around the time of feeding. And it wasn't, it was actually before the hay arrived. And also interestingly, the research that you find, uh, they, it's often, cribbing is often linked to feeding, but Nobody, except one paper I found, looked at hay feeding. They always looked at concentrates. Oh, interesting. And that's obvious because concentrates are easier to, uh, to collect data on because hay, they eat a lot of hay. It mm -hmm. takes a long time to eat hay. And, uh, you know, concentrates, they finish in quarter of an hour. It's gone. So um, there's not much. So even though the research shows some link to, to feeding, the time of feeding. They have not actually shown that for hay, hay feeding. So Blondie showed us that it's, her frequency of cribbing increases with the hay feeding. And it does increase already the anticipation of the feed because <laughs> it's funny if you look at those videos, I watch a lot of videos. Um, I think she probably hears the person who provides the hay arriving with a car. Because it's sort of 15 minutes before I hear him coming into the stall that she starts cribbing. Hmm. So the anticipation of the feed arriving initiates, triggers the cribbing for her. And um, the next step was to prove that, you know, it was a hypothesis. So looking at the data and the time of feeding, so I know what time they were, they were feeding, I know when the cribbing went up, it seems like it's somehow linked to the feeding. So now the experiment was to shift the feeding time. So if I shift the feeding time, does the cribbing shift with that time? So we, she, they were normally fed in the morning at 6.30. So I asked the person who feeds, who was very kind <laughs> to, to play along, so he fed them at six, and I think we repeated that twice. Uh, then he fed them two days at seven, and he fed Blondie two days at eight. Now I couldn't expect the other owners accepting that their horses are fed at eight instead of 6.30. Hmm. So she, Blondie was fed at eight where the, when the others were fed at seven. So she had to wait an extra hour. So, and what the interesting result of this experiment was that the cribbing shifted with the hay feeding. Okay. And that really is remarkable because if you think of it from what is normally said about cribbing is that, you know, it's sort of linked with some internal whatever and, but we could actually influence it very easily by just changing the environment. Hmm. So it's not automatically at that time of day that she starts cribbing. No, if there's no cue that the feed is coming, she's not cribbing. She can easily, I mean, she still cribs, but at a lower frequency. So by shifting that, we can show that it's actually influenced by the environment. The, in, the environment has an impact on the cribbing frequency. It's not independent. It's not something just internal coming out of the, of the horse. It's coming from the environment. Mm. So that's already an important finding. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, and then we did a couple of things because I was, well, I'm a clicker trainer. So obviously I thought, you know, I need to do some clicker training with her. And I did a little targeting session and she learned very quickly, but I lost her after a few minutes and she went off cribbing. So, okay, okay, she's not ready for clicker training. But the good thing was that I realized that feeding her a tiny piece of carrot I can make her crib. <laughs> wow, <laughs> cool discovery. <laughs> right, so this was an on button that I can use for the experiment. Cool. Because I want to see how to switch it off. So in order to switch it off, I need to switch it on, okay? So the next step was to find out um, if we can offer an alternative reinforcer to the cribbing that maybe is stronger that can compete with the cribbing, right? So we were talking about positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, why, why is she cribbing? What is she trying to get? 
and can I replace that reinforcer? So I can switch on the cribbing by feeding her a piece of carrot. Now she can do two things. She can either go for her reinforcer, the cribbing, or I can offer an alternative reinforcer and see if that one can compete. So we did that. Um, Again, in a very nice, nice design. It's an ABAB reversal design. So I could feed her a piece of carrot and I would scratch her because she enjoyed scratching. Because uh, I think at the time she had her rug on and you know, they always feel under the rug a bit itchy. So I would scratch her and feeding the carrot, the frequency of the cribbing went up, obviously. But the moment she would stop cribbing, I would scratch her if she would decide to go by cribbing, I would stop scratching. But the time, every time she does not crib, I reinforce that with scratching and see if she stays with the scratching or she chooses to go back to cribbing. Right? Got it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I could compete with the cribbing. Cool. She chose, she chose to, she chose the scratching as a preferred reinforcer to the cribbing. So I could stop the cribbing by providing scratches. Wow, very and then exciting. The, now the control was to give her the carrot and I go out. Okay, that's the, that's the control. Then again, the experiment, I repeat again, I would scratch and repeat again the control where I would leave the room or the, the box. And um, you can see in the graph, you can see in the graph how the cribbing peaks after the carrot and then if I scratch, it goes to zero. And it stays for the whole five minutes of the experimental condition at zero. Wow. And if I feed the carrot and I do not scratch, she would, you know, continue cribbing. Hmm. So that's another very important piece that you can compete. There are reinforcers that can compete with the cribbing. That's really, really cool. Um, and some of our audience might not understand um, what reinforcers are. So quickly cover that and, and um, you can please add to what I say, you know. Um, but uh, reinforcers are something that you um, add or take away um, to increase the likelihood of a behavior. So, um, uh, so the, you, it sounds like you caught a moment where there weren't, where there were no cribbing behaviors and you reinforce that with scratching to increase the likelihood that um, Blondie would not, um, would continue the not cribbing behavior. That Well, but it was, not a, it was not a training approach. That was just to see if an alternative reinforcer could compete with the cribbing. Right, yeah. So I'm asking Blondie the question, given that now you want to crib, after giving you a piece of carrot, if I offer you, instead of a cribbing, a scratch, would you still crib? Hmm. And she said, no, I'd rather enjoy the scratch. Cool. Yeah. So that was, that was the, answer to Blondie, the, the answer Blondie gave us. So that was, you know, and this, the important piece here is that it's an operant behavior and operant um, protocols can apply. Mm -hmm. So this opens a whole huge toolbox, how we can address it. And that's something we are trying to learn. So, because it's not been done before. So can we, can we use all of this that's out there um, in behavior analysis? Can we use that? And that's what we're trying to, to get at. And so that was, that's the other very, very huge piece. So we have the operant uh, procedures that we can, we can apply. They will work. We just have to find the right one. Very exciting. <laughs> right. So this is still old, actually. So this was part of my thesis that I've done a couple of years ago. And um, that people that decide to donate, no matter what, will get as a small thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so let me continue what we are doing now. So at the moment, um, we are, there are two keywords that describe what we are doing. And the keywords at such will not tell people very much. One is stimulus control, which is a scientific principle from behavior analysis that is huge, 
huge, very, very powerful. And I'm just scratching the surface trying to understand it, but it's very, very, very important and we really need to understand it. And the other one is clean loops. And anyone who's worked with Alexandra Kurland knows about clean loops. Uh, could you so explain basically, clean loops? Oh, you yes, I'll explain it briefly. Go. So what um, Alexandra Kurland, who is my teacher in, in teaching clicker training with horses, she has taught uh, clean loops for, for many years. And it's something she has discussed a lot also with uh, Jesus Rosales Ruiz. In the sense, it's when you are when you are training a behavior, you are you are looking for the smallest entity that is containing all the pieces that you want. That could be as simple as feeding your horse a piece of carrot. So I'm just just by providing a horse a piece of carrot, my mechanics are clean. The horse takes the foot from my hand very softly, you know, and I restart again. That would be a clean loop. Now, what would not be a clean loop is if I would try to scramble in my pocket to get the piece of carrot, but then I find out it's in the other pocket and then I find <laughs> out that it's much too big and I have to bite it off and then I give it to my horse. That is not a clean loop. And also from the horse's point of view, if I even I may be delivering it very nicely, but the horse is taking it with a very tight mouth because he's anxious for some reason, that's also not a clean loop. Right, so I want every element in a in 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 my behavioral loop to be clean in the sense of um, visible behavior, observable behavior, but also the emotional behavior that is linked to it. That it's also part of that clean loop. So the the training approach that Alex teaches is that we always need to work in clean loops. When we have the clean loop, we can expand. So if you are feeding a piece of carrot and my mechanics of feeding is good, my horse takes it softly, <clears throat> I may want to add in a clicker. So I add a, a click and I feed, the horse takes the food, I click again, and then you can expand it a book further. Then you can say, okay, um, I can present a target, I click, I feed the horse, the horse takes it softly, I present the target again. So you are expanding the loop, right? Mm -hmm. But you start always with the smallest piece and then expand it from there. And when you find that your, your loop is not clean anymore, so there's some piece that mm, you don't really like, you go back and make the loop smaller again to, to clean it, sort of to get rid of the behavior that was not as good, right? So maybe the target was not, targeting was not clean, so you go back. <coughs> and we do the same with Blondie because I said earlier, we wanted a moment where she does not crib. So the approach is trying to get a moment where she does not crib and make that bigger and trying to avoid any trigger that would make her crib. So I have to be very careful in expanding it. So also the principle of errorless learning comes in. So you have to do very, very slowly in expanding the loop to avoid that the, tri the, the, the cribbing comes back in. Okay. So People will not understand what I mean. Uh, for Blondie, feeding her makes her crib. But the horse needs to eat. So how can, can I get the hay back in <clears throat> and she does not crib? That's a challenge. So we tried different things. Um, so I, I eventually I taught her targeting and she could stay with me for really long. She would eat two kilos of carrots without cribbing. Um, using a wall target and but as soon as I stopped she would go back cribbing so always in the break so uh, between sessions she would crib she would be super focused no cribbing in the targeting but if the moment I stop it she would crib okay the other thing was that okay I got her attention with the carrots that was fine but the hay would in immediately make her crib so I have to find a way of feeding her the hay that she doesn't crib. So we started with tiny amounts. I was really giving her only one piece of hay and she wouldn't crib. So I had to then shift from small amounts of hay to big amounts of hay that she doesn't crib. So all this in a sense of think of it errorless. So you go from very tiny when it's still good and then try to increase it. Uh, the other thing we did was <clears throat> we changed the environment 
so that she does not she's less likely to crib right so to 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 avoid that error as well and the other important piece is why i said stimulus control so one was clean loops the other one is stimulus control so the stimulus control what we want is want to create two very clear conditions that are totally separate in, in for, for blondie which is one is when i'm there and i'm doing the experiment that's the experiment condition or training condition i call it training condition and the rest of her life when i'm not there which is the normal everyday life condition <clears throat> i have to keep these very very separate because I cannot maintain that clean loop forever. So I can only do it for a very short amount of time. So I have to change the environment to make it clear for her that this is training condition. In this condition, there's no need to crib. We are not cribbing, right? Mm -hmm. And the other one is you can crib whatever you want. This is the normal life condition. So I'm trying to work in the training condition. So these are my stimulus control for non-cribbing, if you want, with a clean loop. And the rest of the day, you can do whatever you want. And this is so strong because I only go to her, as I said, half an hour, Saturday and Sunday, that's it. All the rest of the time, she's doing her normal cribbing, high frequency cribbing. But when I'm there, she can immediately shift to training condition where she's not cribbing. Because we've arranged the environment in a way that for her, this is a totally different environment, even though it's the same box. Mm. I've just changed it a little bit. It looks different. I'm there. Um, I have a small procedure where I send her out first and set my things up and so so she knows okay this is different from normal this is our non-cribbing time and the rest of the day she can crib. Wow and now what we have to do which is the next so at the moment she's at the um, she's able to eat her whole ration of hay 40 minutes and it could be longer it's because I decide uh, it's I want to do something else I get bored she could do it duration is not a problem because the conditions are clear. This is a non-cribbing environment, non-cribbing condition. So time is not the problem. Duration is not the problem. So she can stay in that training environment without cribbing and eating her hay. Now what we need to do, and this is the second part where I'm not, I'm not there yet, but which is what we need in order to apply the protocol as a treatment option for other horses as well, is that we can shift the training condition, blend it into the normal. So expand this if you want uh, to to the normal everyday condition so that she basically in her mind everything is now training condition right the behavior is generalized to all conditions yeah you're 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 the right term would be to transfer stimulus control so we are transferring the stimulus control from the training condition to everyday life sort of so in that sense she uh, yeah the thing is it's difficult to blend it in. You have to do it gradually. If you do it too quick, she would start cribbing again. So you have to do it in a very, very soft way so that she's not even realizing that we have expanded the training condition to everything. So all of a sudden, sudden the training condition is her whole life. But she didn't even realize it because we've done it so gradually. And so she, there's no cue anymore for her to crib. The cues have disappeared. We have excluded them because they are associated to the old condition. And they are in the, they are not present in the new in the new environment that's the plan and that's i think this will work if we do cool. it it's a matter of yeah finding out how to do it and we need the time obviously to change that environment uh give her the time to to adjust and it would be quicker if i could go there more often but um yeah that's the other issue that we can talk about maybe next <laughs> which is more practical and less scientific. <laughs> <laughs> um, it all sounds incredibly exciting. Um, I'm curious, you, once you come to the end of this phase of research, do you have plans for expanding to applying your findings to other horses or what are kind of next steps with these findings? Well, we do step by step. First of all, I need to know that it works. So, <laughs> ideally of course we want it to be to be applied i mean it would be fun say we we managed to do that if this would work ideal case scenario then the best would be to replicate with another horse right and 
than with another horse. If it still works, uh, and we could say that this is solid, you know, there's, you could do all sort of things. I mean, you would first need to do it a couple of more replications in a scientific manner to really have evidence that this, this does work. Uh, and of course, there are, there are different challenges for every condition. I mean, one, certainly the horses are different, but also the setup is different. As I said in the beginning, we had a good setup for the science, not for Blondie, but for the science, it was a very good setup. I think it would be really difficult. People have been asking me, you know, can you do that with a horse that is in the herd? I said, hmm, I'm not sure, you know, the, uh, I'm sure you can still do it, but you have different challenges. Maybe you need to separate the horse for a while or you need to create, somehow you need to create these different, these training conditions. So the more we would, the more frequently we would do it with more horses, the more creative we will become in, in finding a way to create these training conditions, because that's the key. You need to make sure that you create a condition where the horse doesn't crib consistently and then blend it somehow. So I think the more we, different conditions we find, different setups and so on, the more you would learn in, in how to do that. But the important is to show the principle, that the principle works. And then we, we apply it to different settings. And say if it's scientifically, we, we have a couple of good replications in an ideal world. I think then anybody could actually do it because it's not difficult as such. What it takes though is, dedication mm -hmm. right sounds it takes very time. You exciting have to... and very promising yeah yeah it is i mean people have been already asking they want to do it and so i say yeah but really you have to we want we want to do it and and it's something that could be done also by uh you know through video for example they, they could send me videos and and we agree on the next steps uh but to find somebody who's actually dedicated and goes and does that, that will be more challenging because you have to do the video surveillance, you have to analyze the data. So the person who wants to do it has to analyze the data. Yeah. It's not difficult. You, you watch the video and you make, uh, you know, you count the behaviors. It's not, it's not difficult as such, but it takes time to do it. Hmm. And then you would have to apply all these little changes, you cannot rush it. If you rush it, you fail. You have to do it very, very softly and dedicate time to do it. It's not something you just do in a rush, apply the protocol and that's it. No, you have to dedicate time. But I think in the end, everybody would be able to do it. So you don't need, you know, you don't need a laboratory because we're not looking at hormones. We are not looking at cortisol levels. We're not looking at heartbeat. You just watch your horse. You know your horse. Count the behavior. The behavior is very obvious. And uh, follow the protocol and, and keep on counting and do your, your, your summaries and analyze the data and adjust. Anybody can do it. It's really not, um, it would be something that anybody can do, given they dedicate time to it. Mm. Very cool. Now, um, uh, I'd love to get into um, how people can help you with your current project, but they yeah. should should know why they need to help you. So um, give us an update on what's going on with, um, with Blondie and why you're asking for donations right now. Right, thank you. <laughs> so <clears throat> the owner has approached me a couple of weeks ago and he said he decided to sell her. Now this is a longer story because in um, earlier this year Blondie she's a healthy young horse um, who sort of only has this cribbing issue otherwise she's fine she's never colicked or anything but uh, we talked in the beginning about what measures people take to prevent the cribbing and the owner resorted to applying a cribbing collar. I guess people know what a cribbing collar is. It's, um, 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 maybe, but let's go over quickly what that is, just in case there's someone who doesn't. Yeah, it's sort of a strap that you attach around the horse's paw area, the neck area, so that it basically hurts them when they carry out the behavior. Um, so the idea is that since it hurts, they don't do it. However, that doesn't work because what normally happens is in, initially they would stop cribbing, but then they will do it nevertheless. And then the owners often 
apply, make it um, tighter, they tighten it to increase the effect. And uh, in the end, um, often they have, um, they have uh, cuts on their skin, for example, uh, because of the, because it's so tight. Mm -hmm. And so I was actually at the Art and Science of Animal Training Conference in January, I think, this year. And when I came back to see Blondie, I found her with a grabbing collar really tight. I put my fingers in, it was uh, really, really tight. But yeah, she's not my horse, you know, so, and the owner agreed to let me work on her. So I cannot just go and do my thing. Um, and I, 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 was, I was always very careful with him not to criticize because I need access to the horse in order to help her. Right. So um, I left it at that moment, but then later, later when I came to see her next time, she had a facial paralysis. <clears throat> so half of her, so the right side of her face, the, the ear was hanging, dropping down. She didn't close her right eye anymore and the lower right lip is hang, dripping down. Wow. And uh, what I've been told was that they think that she, uh, she lay oddly, you know, and the facial nerve was, was was pressed and uh, that caused the paralysis. But since I've seen her a couple of days with the cribbing collar so tight, <clears throat> my hypothesis was that it was the cribbing collar. And I talked with a colleague who treated her and he said he didn't know about the cribbing collar, but it, uh, at the time he was there, but it could be. Mm -hmm. Of course, okay. we cannot prove that it was the cribbing collar, but I assume it was the cribbing collar that caused right. the paralysis. Mm -hmm. So, because she couldn't close her right eye, she almost lost it. It got infected and um, the, the owner was already ready to, to take the eye out. But he did treat her and uh, luckily she did not lose it. So she's, it looks now that it's healed and uh, it's no big, ish, big issue. But at that moment, I was very worried that the owner will sell her. Because now, in addition of the cribbing, which he knew when he bought her, she had this paralysis. And since he's not emotional about <laughs> his horses, he, he, he sells them, he gets a new one. So um, I told him if he ever decided to sell her to please let me know first. Mm -hmm. And he promised to do that. So that was in February. Now in uh, summer, he bought a new horse. He has a young three year old that he's studying. And as I said, a couple of three weeks ago or so, he told me that uh, he doesn't want to keep Blondie, so he's going to sell her. And as he promised to tell me first, he lets me know. And he told me his, uh, his price for her. And he said, you have, you know, he agreed to give me a month notice. So I'm the only one who knows. Mm -hmm. And I said, right now, I cannot buy her because I had, uh, my son just started university. <laughs> he transferred. He's used up all my money. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, cannot, I cannot buy her at the moment. What I can do is I can maintain her. So if she's with us, I can, she'll be part of our herd and um, she'll be in, living in a wonderful environment, clicker training environment, you know, in a nice group of horses. She would fit in perfectly because my, my gelding is sort of the stallion in the herd and he accepts only females. So she's female, that fits. Um, she's also the same size with the others. The age range is also good. I think uh, that wouldn't be a problem. He would approve her, another mare in the herd. <laughs> and um, we also can, we can place one more, then it's too full, but one more can, one more can fit. Uh, so, and the person who's running the place, she also will also help because I don't have time to take care of three horses, but she will, she will also help. So that's all settled. I can do the maintenance, but I cannot buy the sales price. So I've set up the, the fundraiser to help me get the money together um, because it's not just to buy her out. You know, there are so many horses that need help, that, uh, that need to be rescued. But the thing is, if she's sold, I cannot complete the research. And this research is so exciting. It would be such a shame to lose it because we have 
and that's why I put up the two videos on the fundraiser uh, website, which everybody should look at. It's, it's amazing. I've put these videos, uh, I've just made them two weeks ago, I think. You would see the baseline, as I said, in the single subject design. You do your baseline, you change the conditions and compare. So you see the baseline is I just dropped a little bit of hay in her, in her box and she's cribbing straight away. So she gets the hay, she cribs. She's very standard cribbing behavior, high frequency, very distressing to watch. So I couldn't do it for long. <laughs> I can't watch it. And then I did the training intervention and fading out the training intervention in the end. So the last piece, piece of it I've put uh, as a after video and you'd see nothing in the environment has changed between the first video and the other video. There is less than an hour time difference. It's the same horse. We have to say that because it looks like a different horse. The first one you have the high frequency cribbing. The after you have a horse that just eats her hay quietly. It's so cool. Uh, I think we we both watched mm -hmm. the video uh, on the website and it's miraculous. It's quite jaw dropping <laughs> to see her. Yes, it is. It is obviously, you know, as I said, we, we still need to. So we know it works. We know it works. Now the thing is, I want to expand it, as I said, to transfer the training condition to the normal everyday condition. Now, if, if she's sold off, I can still publish something, right? But we are not, we want more than that. We want, we want actually a protocol that people can replicate and try with their own horse. That's what we want. But if we stop now, that, that would be lost. And I'm not sure I can do this again because this is a private, a private investigation of mine that I'm doing in my free time. And uh, I'm not sure I can do another four years of, of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is once in a lifetime you know, to, to complete this. And it takes very little because I think if I have another three months, I can probably do it. So the fundraiser is for two things. It's one to get Blondie, you know, into a, to spare her the life of, of moving to other owners. And, you know, we're in Italy, in Italy they eat horse meat. So a horse that is cribbing has a facial paralysis. Um, has been handed down already a couple of times. It's not unlikely she may end up with a butcher. Mm -hmm. that, that would be a shame. I mean, she's six years old. She's perfectly fine. But that's a risk, you know. She, and it may not be the next owner, but it may be the one after that. Right. So that's, that's one thing. And, and I know there are many horses who have that, you know, who, who need to be rescued. But the other part of it is this scientific project that I think we, we, are, we can complete in the next two or three months and then publish something that is really relevant and that can really help others because it's a completely new approach of looking at cribbing and the, the ones we have so far are not helping. No. So this would, be, this would be really awesome and I think it takes very little because we don't need a huge funding. The only thing we need and actually people have been super generous since I started, you know, it's, how long is it? Is it even two weeks? Maybe less than two weeks. We have already raised uh, half, half of the total. So um, there's a little bit more effort. I'll be able to buy her and complete the research, publish it and take Blondie home, which I plan to do in spring. So she doesn't need to stay in these conditions for much longer. Let's say until, you know, maybe March maximum March, then we can transition her because we also, she also needs some time to, we have to take the shoes off and prepare her for our, because ours are bare feet. And, uh, we have, it's probably a bit rough for her to go directly on the stones that, that we, the kibble we have are laid out. So we need to transition her also. And, and I have to prepare her for trailer loading and so on. So there's a lot of things to do as well. So she needs a, number, a couple of months where she is now, and then we'll move her to a beautiful place. And probably in this time I can also complete the, uh, the experiment and have something that we can publish. So the plan is one to, to continue the research. And also, um, I added to the, to the funding request, uh, an additional 1,500 euros, which would allow us to publish in an open access journal. 
which does cost that amount of money. You may not know, but um, if you're going on the internet and you're reading an article that is, even though you don't have a university um, enrollment, you can read, that means that somebody paid that amount of money to make it available to others. And I would want to do that as well. I so can, I've added, um, yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say, okay. I can speak to that. Um, being a, a behavior consultant, I'm often trying to look up research and um and it's you know you'll get that wonderful snippet and then it's like That's then funny. you have to pay for the rest of the article and it's like but no and so much of this research like what you're trying to do would be so valuable to so many people who might not be willing to spend that x amount of dollars to view the paper mm -hmm. so um that'd be so cool if, if yeah. you manage to do that no, definitely. I definitely want to do that. But let's say um, first priority is, of course, um, by Blondie. So the owner currently is asking for 4,500 euro, whatever that is in your currency, um, which hopefully I can still uh, negotiate because he uh, he's exaggerating. Um, but say I hope to get her maybe for 4,000. And uh, that's the most important one. Then I can, uh, and there we have sort of a deadline because he may, he has at the moment given me until the time of November to have, uh, you know, first access. And he may decide at any point after that, I mean, even before that, we don't have a contract, um, to go and find buyers, right? So now I, until the end of November, he will not put any announcement out that she's for sale. But uh, starting in December, he may decide at any moment to, you know, put it on the web, various websites and so on and tell people that she, he's selling her. Um, so I would really love to get this done and have her own her by the end of, end of the month. The other thing, the publication can run longer. You know, it does that, that I can just leave it open. It's not a big deal, but um, the... To buy her, um, yeah, that should be, <laughs> should be rather soon. <laughs> and as we're already halfway, so I already have really, um, people have been so generous. It's, it's really amazing. Uh, I thank everyone here at this, at this point. So just a little bit more effort, uh, a little bit more sharing, a little few more donations, and, and I'll get there. And I have set up um, on the website uh, where you can subscribe to an email list. That can, anybody can do, whether they donate or not. And I would keep you updated. So I, I, I'll share the res, some of the results. Uh, I let you know how Blondie does, uh, where we are, if you're going to publish anything. So it's not going to be, don't worry, it's not a marketing thing. I'm not trying to spam you with emails, but from time to time, I think it's nice to get an update for people mm -hmm. uh, where we are. And if anything exciting happened, um, so people know. So I can't follow people individually, but uh, anybody who's interested can put their name, their email in the, in the list that you find on the website and then I just send an email to everybody on that list if there's anything exciting happening. Wonderful um, and I'm going to once again say the website address that's okay. Uh, so, for, so for people who want to learn more about the project or watch the videos which I highly recommend you take a look at. Uh, also if you're interested in donating to the project um, the uh, website address is Blondie, B-L-O-N-D-I-E dot pages, P-A-G-E-S dot ontraport, O-N-T-R-A-P-O-R-T dot net. So get on there. <laughs> um, uh, do you have anything to add, Mira? I, it's just been fantastic um, speaking with you and hearing about your project. Um, really exciting to hear about um, the direction that all of this research could potentially take us in terms of addressing cribbing with horses. So um, just wanting to thank you so much for your time today. It's been really insightful. Yeah, yeah, I, I loved it. Um, Michaela, anything, anything that we missed that's in, important to throw in there or? Or do you think that we... Oh, I just want to encourage people. I mean, just imagine we could create a community, you know, people trying to do crowd science, everyone do their own experiments and share what they find. And 
this could be a community community science project and, and uh, you know later on i'm sure this can be expanded to other behaviors you know that weaving or any it will be the same i don't think it, it's really a difference so this could be a huge uh, huge new community that we can all do together because as i said anybody can do it you just have to dedicate time to it be vigilant take data um and then we could share the little progress and videos and people can help each other so that's always exciting if you think of it very cool okay well um thank you so much and i think that that's a wrap that's a wrap woohoo if you want more friends on horses you can find us on facebook at friends on horses podcast Check it out for all the latest and greatest horsey news. You can find us on the web at friendsonhorsespodcast.com or Instagram at friendsonhorses underscore podcast. Like what you hear? Help us quit our hay jobs by supporting Friends on Horses. You can support us by rating our episodes on iTunes. Becoming an ongoing sponsor through Patreon. Or simply by spreading the word about our show. Have some feedback? We'd love to hear from you. Contact us via email at friendsonhorses at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us. Until next time. <laughs>